of Farina. Uh, I will use uh, some minutes uh, for uh, introducing uh, Professor Dario Farina, who uh, received uh, the PhD um, degrees in automatic control and computer science uh, and in electronics and communication engineering from the Col Central de Nantes in France and Politecnico di Torino in Italy in 2001 and 2002, respectively. And also an honorary doctorate degree in medicine from Olbot University in, De in Denmark in 2018. He is currently full professor and chair in neurorehabilitation engineering at the Department of Bioengineering of Imperial College, London, UK. He has previously been full professor at Aalborg University in Denmark until 2010 and the University Medical Center Göttingen, Georg August University in Germany, where he founded and directed the Department of Neurohabilitation Systems between 2010 and 2016. Among other awards, he has been the recipient of the IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society Early Career Achievement Award in 2010, the Royal Society Wolfson, Wolfson sorry, Research Merit Award in 2016, and he has been elected Distinguished Lecturer IEEE in 2014. He has also received continuous funding by the European Research Council since 2011. His research focuses on biomedical signal processing, neurorehabilitation technology, and neural control of movement. Professor Farina has been the president of the International Society of Electrophysiology and Kinesiology between 2012 and 2014. He is currently the editor in chief of the official journal of this society, the Journal of Electromyography and Kinesiology. Is also currently an editor for Science Advances, IEEE Transactions on Biomedical Engineering, IEEE Transaction on Medical Robotics and Bionics, Wearable Technologies, the Journal of Physiology, IEEE Reviews in Biomedical Engineering. Professor Farina has been elected Fellow IEEE, AIMBE, Isaac, EAMBES. So, it's a great privilege to me and for us to uh, say thank you to Professor Farina for joining us during this seasonal school. Uh, his talk is entitled Interfacing the Human Spinal Cord with Assistive Technologies. Professor Farina, please, the floor is yours and thank you so much. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Stefano, for um such a nice um, introduction and um, thank you to, to you as well and to all the organizers for uh, inviting me um, to this school uh, to, to share uh, our work with, um, uh, with the attendants. Um, so it's a pleasure to meet you all uh, virtually um, as uh, we are used to do. Uh, we don't meet personally anymore since a while. It would be nice to go back to normality at some point but uh, Still, um, uh, virtual lectures uh, now work quite well after uh, we have refined them for, uh, for the past uh, year and a half. Um, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here. I work at Imperial College in London, and today I would like to share with you our experience mainly on the interfacing side um, of uh, uh, the topic of assisting technologies. I will not talk uh, much about mechatronic design uh, or core robotic design, but mainly about interfacing uh, robotic systems, uh, specifically with the spinal cord, which is uh, the approach we have been uh, working on for, uh, for several years by now. So the motivation uh, for this research is uh, the, the topic of the school, so assistive technologies, rehabilitation technologies, that um, can come in a variety uh, of forms and types. Here you can see in this screenshot uh, soft exoskeletons, uh, robots for rehabilitation, prosthesis, uh, and uh, a variety of other devices. So these are uh, motor rehabilitation technologies. And if we think a bit um, on, a, on a broad perspective, 
the Dow neuroprosthesis, we can see that there have been, uh, uh, in the past decades, in the past 60 years approximately, quite um, a, a large deployment of um, uh, sensor prosthesis uh, or uh, electrical stimulation type of prosthesis, such as pacemakers, cochlear implants, deep brain stimulation, even visual prosthesis that now are becoming, uh, are becoming more common. And the motor prosthesis uh, with respect to uh, these other technologies are still, uh, uh, are still lagging behind. Um, and uh, one of the reasons for that is that uh, the bottleneck, the difficulties, the challenges in uh, this type of technologies is uh, the <coughs> interfacing. So uh, motor prosthesis or motor rehabilitation technologies require in most cases, or at least it would be desirable to interface them uh, with the neuromuscular system, interface them with the nervous system of the users, of the patients for various, for various reasons. This interfacing uh, can occur at uh, various levels. Dario, sorry yeah. for interrupting you, but your voice is really noisy. Ooh. People cannot hear well, so I don't know if you have any issue related to the connection. All right, I'm sorry for that. Um, so, um, is, is this a bit better if I get closer to the microphone? Like yes, this? Now it's okay for me. Is yes. It? I can uh, read in the chat that uh, I can uh, try to get closer to the microphone, literally talking uh, on the microphone. Is that uh, uh, helping a bit uh, or uh, alternatively, I can try to change the, the network yeah. to which I'm connected. Much better. Okay. So I'll try, to, I'll try to shout a bit. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I'll try to shout a bit and to be very close to the microphone. So um, I'm sorry for the, for the, for the, past the five minutes in which probably you, you, you couldn't hear too well. Uh, I hope it's getting better now. Um, I was saying that the motor um, neuroprosthesis require uh, in, uh, in many cases an interface uh, with the neuromuscular system of, uh, of patients. This uh, may be due to uh, either direct control of systems such as in prosthesis, or it can be due to the need to induce plasticity in the neuromuscular system um, or to restore some uh, neural pathways. So interfacing um, robotic systems, in particular assistive uh, robotic devices uh, with uh, humans implies uh, um, interfacing uh, either at the brain level, in that case we have uh, a brain computer interface type, uh, of uh, system or at the spinal cord level or at the peripheral nerve level, um, or at the muscle level. Mm. And uh, this interfacing, uh, especially for motor prosthesis, sometimes is very complex. It's very complex because in some cases, uh, we may need to control, or we may desire to control, a large number of degrees of freedom, which means that we may need to have uh, an information transfer uh, provided by the interface, which is uh, quite substantial in terms of information bandwidth. So as I say, there are different approaches to do that. And um, the approach that we have been uh, investigating for uh, some years by now is uh, to assess uh, uh, spinal motor neurons, so motor neurons in the spinal cord, the lower motor neurons. And what I will do in the following 40 minutes or so is to provide an overview of these approaches and then an example of uh, interfacing done with these approaches with the specific assistive technologies. So first, since this is a school and you have, a, I, I assume, a different backgrounds, we will have some basic uh, material. And um, uh, we will start by uh, defining what are the target cells for our interfacing. As I say, these are cells in the spinal cord, they are lower motor neurons. Motor neurons are cells that um, connect to the muscles. So actually, they are the only neural cells that do not connect with other neural cells, but rather connect to muscles for uh, movements. 
they receive um, input for the, from the entire neuromuscular system. So they receive synaptic input from the entire neuromuscular system and discharge action potentials to the muscle fibers. So if, um, if we look at it from, um, from an engineering point of view, the role of the central nervous system is to send commands to the motor neurons. Ultimately, uh, the motor neurons are the cells that instruct the muscles to, uh, to activate. So movement is the task of uh, distributing input to these final cells that are the final cells uh, integrating neural information in order for these cells to provide commands, to provide commands to the muscle. So the motor neuron, each motor neuron uh, is uh, in, uh, connected to a number of muscle fibers and the motor neuron and the connected muscle fiber constitute uh, the so-called motor unit. The motor unit um, is the quantum of human movements. It's the smallest uh, functional unit that can be controlled during voluntary uh, movements. The motor unit, again, from the engineering point of view, since uh, most of you are engineers, can be seen as a transducer. Mm? It is actually a transducer. It's a biological transducer that trans transduce uh, uh, synaptic input to the motor neuron, so the input received by the motor neuron, into uh, forces generated by muscle fibers. So it transduces uh, between two physical variables. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can also be seen as the frontier between uh, neural processing of movement and actual behavior, actual uh, function. Mm -hmm. So the motor unit is quite um, an interesting uh, unit to investigate and also to interface. Now, um, again, since this is a school, uh, it would be interesting to discuss uh, some basic uh, uh, anatomical facts. For example, it is interesting to discuss how many are the motor neurons in the spinal cord that control our limbs. This is relevant for interfacing, of course, because uh, if we know the number, we know our engineering specifications when we want to interface them. So there's a recent study between um, um, our group and the, and the medical university in Vienna counting uh, efferent, so motor fibers and sensory fibers in peripheral nerves. So this is relevant um, uh, as a basic study for a number of uh, interfacing uh, technologies. And the idea was uh, in uh, cadavers to harvest uh, specimens uh, of uh, peripheral nerves from the brachial plexus, so this was for the upper limb, up to the wrist at different levels. And then with imaging techniques, counting, as you can see, the motor fibers. So these are the uh, fibers that bring information from motor neurons to muscles and the sensory fibers that are the fibers that bring information from the periphery, from the body uh, to the spinal cord. So when doing this um, experiment, um, uh, one uh, initial uh, result, which is interesting, is that the percentage, the percentage of motor fiber, efferent fibers, with respect to the sensory fibers that are afferent fibers, is rather small. So the majority of fibers uh, in a peripheral nerve is uh, uh, sensory. So if you will look um, at the peripheral nerve and if you could see the flow of information in different colors, let's say red and green as the information that goes to the spinal cord in red and the information that leaves the spinal cord in green, from a distance, you would see mainly a red color. You will mainly see information flowing from the body, from the periphery into the spinal cord. And a very small amount of information that goes from the spinal cord to the body. So the message is that um, uh, movement mainly require uh, sensory feedback and a small amount of motor commands. Now, this has uh, some interesting implications from the physiological point of view, which uh, uh, I will be interested in discussing, but I will not do it in this occasion. But from the interfacing point of view, it also means that um, interfacing the motor fibers in peripheral nerves um, is not that complex uh, because they are not in a very large number. So to make an example that I always make in this type of lectures, if we consider uh, the entire intrinsic muscle of the end, 
to all the muscles in our hand, and we count how many motor neurons in the spinal cord control those muscles. And remember that uh, those muscles are responsible for the most dexterous and complex actions that we can perform. Well, this number is below 2,000, so it's a very, very small uh, number. Of course, it's much smaller than the cortical area control in the end. And this number is also uh, suitable for interfacing, meaning that uh, we can design interfacing technologies that, uh, in principle, access uh, uh, all those uh, uh, neural cells. So motor neurons in the spinal cord are in a relatively small number, as we have just discussed, and uh, discharge action potentials that connect to the muscle. So as I say, this is uh, sometimes um, uh, overlooked, but uh, motor neurons are the only neural cells whose axon does not connect to another neural cell, as uh, in the central nervous system, as in, in most part of the spinal circuits, but instead of connecting to another neural cell, it connects to another type of cell that is the muscle fiber through the neural muscle junction, which is a synapsis as well as um, any other type of synapsis. So the motor neuron um, uh, connected to the muscle fibers, uh, and every time the motor neuron is charged an action potential, uh, an action potential is generated, the corresponding one at the muscle fiber level. And the action potential generated by the muscle fibers because of the neural code sent by the motor neurons generate electrical activity, which is commonly recorded over the muscle and which is known uh, electromyography signal as uh, uh, all of you uh, would know. Mm. So the electrical activity of the muscles mm, is uh, the electrical activity of muscle fibers, uh, which derives from uh, the neural code sent by the motor neuron. This also implies that uh, from EMG recordings, we can extract uh, the neural code coming from the spinal cord by decoding the input from the motor neurons. Again, this is a unique property of uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord, being uh, the only neural cells for which we have a natural, a natural biological amplifier, which is the muscle that allow us to look at the activity of motor neurons from uh, the periphery, so recording from muscles. So the idea to use muscles uh, as um, an amplifier of motor neuron activity has been exploited uh, since uh, many years. And again, since this is a school, it's um, interesting to look at uh, classic studies. So this is uh, a study by Basmejian in science and this is basically the first uh, neural interface with the spinal cord realized uh, in a minimally uh, invasive way. So Basmejian in the 60s put uh, micro needles uh, in an end muscle, and these micro needles were recording spiking activity that were coming from the muscle fibers, but uh, actually were corresponding to the uh, neural commands sent uh, from the motor neurons in the spinal cord. So each of these spiking activity corresponded actually to a spike coming out of the spinal cord and corresponding to a single neuron. And in this uh, study, Basmation demonstrated that, that humans can voluntarily control the firing rate of these motor neurons. So this, is what, this was the first demonstration that humans can volitionally control individual neural cells. And this demonstration came from the spinal cord before coming uh, uh, for the cortical neurons uh, later on in the following decades. And uh, when this uh, proof arrived, cortical neurons, that was the beginning of the era of uh, uh, brain interfacing. Hmm? So this shows the same time of interfacing uh, for uh, spinal motor neurons. So with this type of techniques, so with these um, invasive uh, systems that are inserted in muscles, um, we have uh, for several years uh, investigated motor neurons in the spinal cord with a relatively simple um, experimental, uh, experimental systems. So basically needle electrodes that can be inserted acutely with uh, minimal invasive techniques that do not require surgery, but simple uh, uh, needle insertion. 
The first of these needles, by the way, was proposed in the 20s by Adrian and Borg in a Landman paper in the Journal of Physiology that basically opened the era in the past uh, almost 100 years of the study of motor neurons in the spinal cord. And the concentric needle proposed by Adrian and Bronk is still the same needle that each of you can um, experience if you have a clinically ex uh, EMG examination in, um, in a clinical neurophysiology department of uh, any hospital worldwide. So, the, so we have these techniques uh, for almost uh, 100 years, uh, but um, these techniques are mainly used uh, so far for basic physiological investigations. So these are um, examples, again, of classic studies using uh, invasive um, uh, methods to study motor neurons in vivo. So this is uh, an example of a study in nature in the 70s, looking at uh, how motor neurons, you see spiking activity, are controlled during uh, an increasing and decreasing force contraction. Mm -hmm. And at this time in the 70s, uh, it was very popular to challenge or to discuss the enema size principle, which is the, the principle of recruitment of motor neurons during voluntary contractions, of which this study focuses on. And here you can see another classic study from the 70s, looking at the firing rate of motor neurons when voluntary increasing force in humans, showing an increase in firing rate depending on the force. So in the past 90, 100 years, we used these techniques to build a big knowledge on the voluntary control of movement by spinal motor neurons as the final common pathway of the neural muscle system. The issue is that in the past 100 years, it has basically never been discussed the possibility to use these techniques for actual interfacing, for example, for connecting this type of neural activity with an external robotic device. And the reason why this has never been discussed or thought is that these techniques are extremely selective. They identify one or two neurons at a time, and so they lack a population analysis, and they are basically very limited if we think at a classic interfacing um, approach. More recently, though, uh, let's say in the past 10, 15 years, um, there have been the discussion of uh, using techniques of mass recordings for interfacing motor neurons, not only to study the details uh, of uh, neural control of movement, but also to actually connect these neurons to external devices such as uh, external robots. And in order to do that, the idea has been uh, that uh, of expanding the number of motor neurons we can assist with um, a larger pool of neurons uh, decoded. The basic idea has been quite uh, uh, simple. Uh, instead uh, of recording from uh, individual uh, signals from muscles, uh, the idea has been to cover muscles with hundreds or thousands of uh, electrodes, either inside muscles or on the surface of the muscle. And so recording, uh, instead of a single channel or a few channels, recording thousands of EMG channels. So basically uh, building uh, methods that can uh, uh, provide muscle imaging, as you can see in this uh, simple uh, sleeve uh, with number of electrodes, muscle imaging rather than single uh, muscle record. So the EMG has been uh, transformed rapidly in the past 20 years in an imaging technique, as you can see here. So you can place electrodes over uh, uh, limbs, also inside muscles, um, and uh, you can uh, reconstruct the electric fields over the body surface. Mm. These electric fields, uh, similar to EEG, uh, would contain uh, the activity for, uh, from neural cells. In case of muscle recordings, these activities is from muscle fibers, which are non-neural cells. But as we have seen, the activity of muscle fibers exactly corresponds to the activity of neural cells in the spinal cord. And so those um, uh, images that you can see on the skin surface are made of thousands of individual electric fields 
each of them can be associated to a motor neuron in the spinal cord. So now you have to imagine that you have the spinal cord, and each time a motor neuron is active, discharging a shunt potential, it generates an electric field on the skin surface of the muscle. So the skin surface of a line muscle is like a remote screen, is literally a remote screen where we can look at the activity of motor neurons. Each motor neuron contributes with a short movie that uh, is the signature of its activity. So motor neuron one in the spinal cord will produce an electric field of this type that evolves over, evolves over time in a, a few to 10 milliseconds. And this short movie is summed to the electrical activity generated by a number of other motor neurons. And all this is summed into a very complex uh, mixture of activity on the skin. Now, the idea is that uh, from these mixtures uh, that we get on the skin, it is possible mathematically to go back uh, to the sources that is the motor neurons, because it's just a matter of identifying electric fields. So in theory, it is possible. And if we can do that, then we would have um, a, a passage from uh, a muscle interface to a neural interface. Mm -hmm. We would be able to look uh, at the output of the spinal cord directly in terms of individual activity of action potential from the neurons. Mm -hmm. So this can be done. And uh, as I said, it can be done because each group of muscle fibers innervated by a motor neuron somewhere in the spinal cord contribute with a unique signature. And so this unique signature, as I said, is the remote signature that we look on the skin from motor neurons in the spinal cord. So basically the axon of the motor neurons that connect to the muscle fiber is like a wire of a motor neuron that goes to a remote screen and our remote screen is our body surface. So motor neurons are the only neural cells in the human body that are connected to a natural remote screen where we can record their, their activity. So mathematically, uh, this implies that the neural information contained in the spinal cord, which is here, uh, is a series of action potential coming from the motor neurons and going to muscles. And uh, muscles will generate action potentials. And the generation of action potential is our screen uh, so our screen implies that there is a transfer function of those biological screens, one for each motor neuron. So each motor neuron will have a different transfer function. And then uh, all these activities are summed in a mixture, which is uh, what we read from the skin surface, which is our biological screen. The idea is that we have to decode this inside information, which is the information that remotely the motor neuron are sending to the skin surface. So this is uh, another way of showing the problem mathematically. It's a simple way, actually. We have the sources that are spiking activity. These are neural sources in the spinal cord. And uh, they are transformed by a matrix, which is the transfer function of our bi biological screens. And we observe here on the skin surface uh, in the pixels of those biological screens. So how do we get back the sources? We had to invert this transfer function. So we had to identify this mixing matrix. Now look at that from an from a interfacing point of view. From an interfacing point of view, this is what we record from muscles. So this is a muscular interface, which is a classic Mario interface. And this is what we have from the spinal cord, from the output of the spinal cord. This matrix H, which is the transformation at the muscle level, which is unknown, is the matrix that allow us to go from one type of interface to the other. If we identify this matrix H, we can uh, apply the inverse of this matrix to a muscle recording and we get a neural recording. Or vice versa, we can apply this matrix H to a neural recording and get a muscle recording. So if we are able to identify this matrix H, we basically go, from the muscle level to the spinal cord level mathematically. Mm? We go up and down. Mm? And uh, by inverting the matrix H is uh, 
uh, equivalent to having a microscope into the output of the spinal cord by recording from muscles. So this matrix H can be identified. Uh, it can be identified by transforming the convolutive problem in a linear mixture problem. And then uh, if you see this problem in this way, you can see that this is a blind separation problem. Mm -hmm. Blind separation problem, for example, could be solved uh, by ICA type of techniques by optimizing some uh, criterion. For example, non-Gaussianity if you have a classic ICA. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a purposes type of optimization in classic ICA. The small problem in, uh, in this application is that the sources that we have uh, are not independent. So the high part of ICA cannot be applied. We do not have independent component analysis. We have to use other criteria. One other criteria possible is the sparsity of, the, of these sources. Mm -hmm. So the neural sources are sparse mathematically where mathematically sparse implies that they are almost always zero and occasionally they are different from zero. So we can maximize the sparsity and we can solve this blind separation problem, identifying the inverse matrix by optimizing the identification by maximization of sparsity. And this is an example of a sparsity criterion for two neural sources. How does that work? Well, it works in a way that now if you have a mass of recordings like this one, is a multi-channel mass of recording, uh, which is color-coded, then you can blindly identify these uh, um, uh, transformation matrix, and you can apply the inverse of this matrix to the mass of recording. And if you apply the inverse of this matrix, then you get the neural sources. And this is an example of this approach. So this is a, a, a column of the inverse of that matrix. You apply it to this mass of recording. The mass of recording is a recording of this type, meaning that each of these rows are a classic Mayo signal of this type. But you can blindly identify a transformation that maximize the sparsing of this Mayo signal. And by applying this transformation, you get a signal like that which is actually the spiking activity of a motor neuron in the spinal cord. Mm. So now this is interesting because you can see from this level to this level, you exactly go mathematically through this transformation from a muscle interface to a neural interface. And you can go from one to another mathematically um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the way you desire. And uh, you can do that uh, now also by instructing neural networks to do that. So this type of developments come from classic statistical signal processing that have been developed in the past 15 years. Now, with a bit more modern approaches, you can also train a neural network to learn that transformation from muscle to neural information. Mm -hmm. This is an example of work of one of our PhD students uh, demonstrating with uh, uh, gate recurrent units uh, in a complex network how the problem can be solved also from a deep learning point of view. Mm. All right, so now the process is the following. You have um, a, an interface in, uh, at the muscle level, which means that it can be applied uh, also clinically in a viable way. This interface provides muscle imaging as we have discussed. And this muscle imaging with source separation go back to the spinal cord by providing us the neural code. So by decoding these neural cells that uh, at the level of the spinal cord decode or encode the neural information of movements. So this is a neural interface with single neural cells um, that can be uh, provided uh, or realized in a completely non-invasive or in a minimal invasive way, meaning that we can also implant electrodes in muscles in a even minimal invasive uh, configuration. So of course, uh, once you have these uh, approaches, uh, you can start to a window into the neural control of movement, which is very much related to a window into controlling assisted devices. Mm -hmm. So this is work of Simone Tanzarella, who is, who is now at uh, the Italian Institute of Technology and uh, He's just finished the PhD with us. And uh, 
This is work covering the extrinsic and intrinsic masses of the ends in humans by a number of these electrodes in order to decode uh, during natural movement in vivo, the neural code from the spinal cord that, uh, um, that underlie the activity of uh, uh, several muscles controlling the end. Mm -hmm. So now you can take uh, this neural code and you can look, uh, for example, at the dimensionality of this neural code in a view to control uh, uh, an exoglobe, just to make just to make an example. Mm -hmm. And this is very recent work, actually still not uh, uh, publicly available, but just a set in the Journal of Neuroscience. And you may look at that in a few in a few days when it's uh, when it's up. Uh, so in this work, for example, complex movement of the end could be decoded in um, a small dimensionality, which are synergies. But in this case, instead of the classic muscle synergies, which has been investigated in the past uh, several years, in this case, you can have synergies at the motor neuron level. So you may have synergies uh, or primitive uh, control commands by looking at clusters of motor neurons in the spinal cord, so abandoning the muscle view and looking at the neural view of uh, the neural control of movement. Mm -hmm. So since we have a very small dimensionality underlying the control of um, uh, approximately 15 muscles, then you can use this small dimensionality and this control signal associated to this small dimensionality as effective control signals, uh, for example, for extended analysis. You can also look uh, at uh, higher level of control. So by decoding uh, the output of motor neurons in the spinal cord, you can also estimate the components coming down from uh, uh, higher centers. Mm -hmm. So this is a demonstration of this. This is a decoding of motor neurons innervating the tibialis anterior muscle in this uh, uh, basic uh, physiological study. And this is the coherent spectrum of these motor neurons. And you can see in, coherent spectrum, in this coherent spectrum, there are spectral components uh, in the high frequency uh, bands. And some of these spectral components, such as uh, uh, around 20 hertz, uh, corresponds to cortical oscillations coming down to these motor neurons. And here you can see the preparation of a movement in which you have a constant force contraction and then you have an increase in force uh, with a Q, but before the force increases, you have a desynchronization decrease in the power of the beat oscillation that corresponds exactly to the cortical activity. But in this case, it is decoded from the spinal motor neuron. So basically, this is decoded at the muscle level. So this means that with these techniques, uh, you don't only have an access uh, to motor neurons in the spinal cord, but you even have uh, a sort of a brain interface in its own right, because you decode uh, oscillatory activity coming from brain structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this reason, you can build uh, biofeedback technologies, for example, uh, for rehabilitation or for other, uh, for other reasons, in which uh, you provide a feedback on uh, higher level oscillations through the coding at the spinal cord level. And I will not go into details of this biofeedback work, but this is uh, also recently published by one of our, another one of our PhD students. So um, how do we use this technology then to, to actually interface with external devices? Well, in principle, this could have um, a very broad uh, interface applicability. And to show you the broadness of these applicabilities, I will start by showing something that could be really broad, and this is even from the medical field. So this is work of Facebook, uh, and actually Control Labs who was um, a company now merged with Facebook, and also collaborating with us in a number of projects, developing uh, bracelets uh, that contain uh, a number of uh, uh, EMG electrodes. And the idea is uh, exactly to make this decoding of individual cell activity from uh, a smart device of this type. Mm -hmm. So the long-term goal is to have uh, a smart device, for example, mounted at the wrist. And with this decoding technique, going back to the spinal cord and even to the brain level, and then having uh, a control over uh, 
uh, external devices, and this is large consumer electronics, of course, it's not even medical application. Mm -hmm. So this is work of uh, one of our PhD students working with Facebook, showing um, with um, a wrist-worn device, the possibility of decoding the activity of single fingers. And here you can see the neural code decoded. So these are spinal motor neuron activities decoded for each finger movement. So these are like barcodes for which uh, one can reach almost perfect decoding of uh, individual finger control with a wristband, a wristband device. But of course, uh, um, our main interest and also the, the focus of this school is uh, on assisted technologies. Mm -hmm. And so I will uh, finish this talk in the next uh, five minutes or so by showing you um, an application among the many that we are investigating in terms of assisted technologies of this type of interfacing for um, uh, spinal cord injury patients. So this is work done uh, together with uh, Pittsburgh University and uh, uh, the, the target are patients who have um, an high level uh, uh, spinal lesion. Uh, these are patients that are motor complete. So that means that clinically there is no uh, movement of cervical. And these are also patients that in, in Pittsburgh have a cortical implant. So they have a brain interface of which I will not uh, talk today. And they have a cortical implant because they have a, a motor complete uh, uh, spinal lesion and therefore uh, they are um, into a clinical trial for, uh, for a brain interface. In these patients, uh, we tested a much simpler interface than a brain, than, a, than an intracortical brain interface. And specifically, we investigated this type of very simple wearable systems that are sleeves that I've discussed uh, so far. And the idea was to check whether there is uh, any residual muscle activity, and if there is, uh, whether it is possible to go back to the spinal cord, basically looking for the first time at the activity of uh, motor neurons below uh, a complete, uh, a motor complete, clinically motor complete spinal cord lesion. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that a few motor neurons may still be spared in terms of voluntary commands coming from supraspinal center. So this is one of the uh, experiments done on, uh, on these patients. It's very simple, as you can see. This is um, a, a grid of electrodes on the skin surface. And uh, the patient is uh, instructed to attempt the movements of single fingers. And uh, clinically, there is no movement detectable uh, since uh, the paralysis is, um, is complete. Now, when attempting this movement, um, there is some EMG activity, as you can see. It's very small, the EMG activity. It's actually just above the noise level, especially for finger control. But there is some EMG activity. The interesting thing is that this EMG activity uh, that corresponds to uh, the imaging that I was discussing at the beginning can actually be decomposed in the activity of individual uh, uh, neural cells in the spinal cord. So actually we can look at single motor neurons in the spinal cord below the lesion. And this is the activity of five motor neurons, for example, uh, action potential by action potential during index flexion and extension. If we then uh, analyze this uh, motor neuron with uh, synergistic techniques uh, similar to what I've shown you in the movement of the end in healthy individuals, then we, then we can see a lower dimensional control that is indicating the uh, oscillatory activity of uh, uh, flash and extension corresponding to tapping attempted by these patients mm, in a very clear way. Uh, and you can see the flash and extension movements with two modules that are basically the two low level uh, synergies at uh, the uh, motor neuron at the motor neuron level. And here you can see um, the same type of data and you can see the modulation of motor neuron during tapping. And of course, this neural activity then can be used uh, to control an external device uh, in a much clearer way than an intracortical recording because this activity is immediately related to the actual task mm -hmm. because it's the last neurons uh, coding that type of uh, uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. 
and is the same from this, from this function. Not only, but uh, with this type of interface, and as I said before, if you look in the same patients, in the same patients at the coherent spectrum of these motor neurons, you can see the low frequency band, which is the band that we can use for control, but you can also see a higher frequency bands, for example, the beta, the beta activity, that we can connect to the activity of the corticospinal tract. And so this can be used either as an additional control signal for assisted devices, or more importantly, as a biomarker um, looking, for example, at uh, partial recovery or the effect of treatment. So basically, this is a window to the cortical structures that are controlling those few, those few remaining motor neurons. So what we are developing now um, is um, a full system for which we have uh, high density recording from uh, intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the end. With, uh, we can do that with thousands of electrodes now. We are developing uh, miniaturized electronics that can be embedded. So now we have, uh, uh, didn't have time to discuss, but we have um, EMG amplifiers that uh, can um, amplify uh, several hundred of channels uh, in the size uh, of a credit card. So this can be embedded in a system. And then we are developing uh, a soft test of skeletons uh, for the end specifically that would be controlled by this kind of neural activity. So basically we would have uh, a muscle activity, which is the muscle imaging from, uh, uh, from uh, textile electrodes that can be in uh, the number of hundreds or even thousands. And then with the techniques I explained to you from the muscle level, we can uh, decode the neural level. So now we have the spinal cord level. And then from the spinal cord level, we can go into control uh, in real time of, um, for example, uh, an assistive uh, uh, approach to recover, to recover and function. I will go to the summary so that we are on time for, the, for um, five, 10 minutes of questions if there, are, if there will be questions. As a summary, I focus my talk on the spinal motor neurons that are currently the only neural cells that we can access with wearable sensors. So we can develop wearable technology that look at the activity of individual neural cells. This is unique in uh, the repertoire of neural cells we can interface. We now have decoding methods that allow identification of this spiking activity of neural cells by decoding electric fields from the body surface. By doing that, we can look, we can look at the neural code of movement. Uh, and uh, I didn't discuss this in this occasion, but uh, our group, for example, and many other groups are very interested uh, in the basic understanding of neural control of movement by having this window on the spinal cord. But especially these neural interfaces can be used to control assistive technologies or even therapeutic devices, for example, in the biofeedback configuration, uh, either for medical applications or even for, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, large consumer electronics application, or even in the future for human augmentation, the topic that uh, I've not uh, discussed today, but that would be interesting to, uh, to, to open. So with this, I thank you very much for the attention. I hope uh, that uh, the audio uh, got better after the first five minutes. And um, if you have any questions, I would be, uh, of course, very happy to answer. Thank you so much, Professor Farina, for your inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, yes, uh, it was uh, great uh, to listen to all this uh, important and relevant uh, research, uh, also in terms of uh, uh, translational research. Uh, yes, we have a, a first question from uh, Sara Esposito. Uh, Sara, can you uh, pose uh, by yourself the question uh, you just wrote on the chat to Professor Farina, if you want? Uh, yes, sorry, I couldn't see the chat uh, during the lecture. So yes. don't, don't worry, don't worry, Professor Farina. I, I'm, I'm, I'm here for this. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm just uh, asking uh, Sara, uh, are you there? Yes, of course. Oh, thank you so much, Sara. So yes. please, uh, you can pose the, uh, your question to Professor Farina. Please proceed, uh, move forward. Okay. 
Okay, first of all, thank you very much for your very insight, insightful presentation. Then I have a question related to the motor unit identification um, uh, using uh, neural networks that you showed uh, us uh, before. Uh, I would like to know if uh, have you have used invasive recordings of motor units in order to build the ground truth uh, to allow the neural network to learn. Or for example, if you use uh, some statistical techniques such as, uh, such as uh, yeah. sensors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the for the question. So the question is very relevant because, of course, um, um, in, in the scheme of neural network that I've shown, that's a supervised scheme. So the question of Sarah is that we need to train the neural network and, and to train the neural network, we have to provide some labeled uh, ground truth. Um, in this case, we had um, a we validated uh, with intra, intramuscular recordings, but the training of the network was done with a labeling uh, done with conventional statistical blind separation. So in, uh, in our case, we had the labels extracted with uh, blind separation, train the network, uh, and then having the network working on new data. And one would ask why to start, uh, why to have a network uh, if you have already a blind separation approach that works, and um, the answer is that the network can then be generalizable uh, uh, to be more robust, for example, by data augmentation in the training. So once we have the labeling, we can then augment that um, uh, training data by having artificial noise uh, or having a, a number of other non-stationarities. So the network will be more robust. So the initial training has been done uh, with a blind separation approach and then uh, with data augmentation, the network become more robust than the methods originally used for training. Okay, and uh, can I ask you uh, please, uh, what about the amount of data necessary to train uh, this type of, uh, of neural network in this application? Yeah, in this application, uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's a lot, but it can be obtained not all experimentally. So one can have a relatively small amount of experimental data and then augment those data. For example, experimentally, one may obtain um, uh, some EMG signals and then it can decode with classic blind separation and then it can scramble the action potentials by changing the statistic underlying. So by combining uh, uh, data augmentation with uh, experimentally recorded data, the training phase become reasonable in terms of uh, time of recorded data. Uh, so in our case, by the way, reasonable means uh, um, a few minutes of recorded data in, for training. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank other you. question from the audience? Uh, please don't be shy. Uh, it's a, a unique opportunity uh, and uh, I, I am grateful that on behalf of the organizing committee uh, that Professor Farina uh, has uh, delivered uh, this inspire, inspiring and amazing talk. So please, uh, as a researcher in this field, I would exploit uh, this opportunity. If not, uh, I will pose uh, uh, my question. Is, Stefano, sorry, there ah, is a question from Roberto okay. Borghini. Okay. is going to ask something. Okay. Yes, please, good morning. Uh, um, good morning, Professor. Good morning. I, I, I'd like to ask you a question about the transfer function, H. Um, and I want to know if you can generalize the transfer function to uh, different people with the same physiological condition, or if you have to calculate a new, a new matrix for each person. Yeah, no, you have to calculate it for each person um, at the moment. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So that, uh, that uh, transfer function um, um, indicates uh, the volume conductor between uh, the, the fibers and the recording electrodes. And so it is uh, dependent on the, on the person. We cannot exclude that, uh, that um, it will be possible to train uh, a neural network uh, that would uh, learn to do that operation uh, in a more universal way uh, by using uh, non-linear mapping. Um, but if we remain uh, with a linear solution, uh, then uh, that is unique uh, uh, for each person. Thank you. 
Uh, we have a question from Martina. Martina La Presa, please proceed. Thank you. Hi. Martina. Hello. Thank you for, sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you presented uh, this approach mainly for assistive uh, purposes. But um, what about applications for uh, amputees? So for people uh, with prosthetic devices, which could be uh, the change in the setup? How do you think uh, this, uh, this kind of approach can be applied for amputees? Yeah. Yes, thank you for the question, uh, Martina. The, so the, um, in amputees, uh, you have uh, nerves, uh, the stamp that has been uh, resected. So uh, to apply this approach, uh, you have um, usually a combination um, of uh, surgery with nerve transfers and uh, neural decoding. So what we uh, and other groups uh, uh, do is to take the nerves um, of amputee uh, patients uh, at the stamp surgically and uh, redirect them to muscles uh, above the amputation and uh, this is called uh, targeted muscle innervation. It's uh, a procedure uh, developed in Chicago uh, by Todd Kaiken around 20 years ago. And once the innervation occurs, then uh, again, uh, you have a bioscreen and uh, you can apply the same techniques that I have uh, indicated by decoding uh, the, the neural code coming from nerves that previously were innervating the missing limb. So in principle, you can reconstruct the full neural cord of uh, the full missing limb if you combine uh, nerve transfer surgery with this type um, of uh, neural decoding. And this has been done, although uh, not in a full translational way, meaning that there are not yet devices that are working um, uh, on these concepts in a clinical uh, uh, basis, but we have... Uh, a large um, ERC project uh, in synergy with uh, Professor Asman uh, and uh, Professor Bicchi uh, from IIT, uh, trying to push exactly these developments uh, for, uh, for amputees. Okay, thank you so much again. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Mattia, Mattia Franchi, please. I, thank you for your presentation. I really like that. Uh, I, I follow your work uh, since a couple of years. And uh, I was wondering, and sorry for the question, maybe too, too strange, <laughs> uh, but uh, I was wondering for the use of uh, high density MG uh, acquisition for, um, um, for spinal cord injuries, uh, injured patients uh, that you presented before. Uh, you uh, used a technique that uh, it seemed to me that uh, resembled the uh, actual observation training. I don't know if you are familiar with this technique. Uh, basically, it uh, uh, starts from the, um, the uh, for, for, uh, concept of the mirror and uh, neurons. So uh, my, I don't know if you know about this um, this concept, but my question is, uh, can you, uh, since you proposed a, um, a spatial or a functional uh, detection of uh, neuron spiking in the brain, can you use this uh, approach, uh, this non-invasive approach and uh, not uh, an approach that do does not require the use of uh, MRI or full functional MRI in order to map uh, the uh, mirror neurons and their response uh, to videos or other sort of things. So, yeah, thank you, Mattia. So this is a, an important question also in relation to what I, uh, to what I said that maybe has, has to be clarified. So I indicated that uh, you can go higher to cortical structures or brain structures by decoding uh, the input that the, the spinal motor neurons are receiving. So in this sense, uh, uh, of course, the limitation of this uh, statement from me and, the, and of the technique that is peripheral is that you can decode uh, everything that goes down. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, of course, a lot of uh, uh, cortical and brain processes that um, do not uh, go down uh, 
to the spinal cord uh, through uh, spinal pathways, but remain uh, at the brain level. And, um, and some of these, for example, are related to mirror neurons. And uh, of course, in this case, uh, we would not uh, see these processes uh, simply because uh, they don't have any input to spinal motor neurons. So from some respects, uh, what we can look in terms of brain activity is everything that ultimately is projected to the spinal motor neuron. There are a lot of brain functions that uh, are relevant for movement, but they are not necessarily projected eventually to the spinal motor neuron. Okay, so if I... A bit of a broad uh, uh, answer, but uh, I, I think it's, it's an important clarification. No, 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 I, it's perfect, but uh, I was thinking, uh, uh, since the mirror neurons are not uh, the uh, direct connection be between the uh, spinal cord, uh, but uh, they can uh, trigger some neurons uh, to the spinal net, uh, the spinal tract. So, it, do you think uh, in the future, if it's possible, to map this connection based by this, uh, this technique? It's only only wondering about that. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, uh, Mattia, this is a very a very interesting um, macro topic because uh, even just understanding um, which are the exact mechanism for which uh, neural information is sent down to the spinal cord, um, it's, still, it's still quite unclear. For example, uh, when we talk about uh, the main information sent uh, from the brain to the spinal cord, we always talk about beta activity which is 20 hertz, which is a clear oscillation uh, of cortical circuits associated to the cortical spinal tract. But if you think of that, the beat activity being in the range of 20 hertz is outside the bandwidth of the musculoskeletal system. So it doesn't produce movement directly. So also the beat activity in the same way as the mirror neurons do not directly produce movement simply because movement is such a slow phenomenon with respect to cortical oscillations. Mm -hmm. uh, for the same reason, uh, it's, uh, we still don't understand which are the pathways and which are the, the bandwidth and the methods in which uh, uh, synaptic input uh, is demodulated in, this, in the restricted bandwidth of movement. So all these questions, uh, um, so for example, question of uh, how much we can infer about the neural cells that indirectly communicate with cortical cells in order to produce movement, or which are the pathways for which um, input to interneurons and spinal motor neuron produce movement. All these incredibly are open questions and they are open questions because of the lack of methods that allows in vivo to sample from a large population of neural cells. And maybe these approaches uh, will contribute uh, uh, to that, but there is, a lot to, there is a lot to do. There are a number of PhD projects to do. So if any of you are still to choose a PhD project, then write to me. There are, if you're interested in these topics, we, we can offer tens or hundreds of PhD projects. Okay. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your answer. Thank you, Professor Farina. We are a, sit, a still bit uh, of time, so thanks a lot for your talk, amazing talk. Uh, thank you, Dario, for being with us. And I think we have to move to the next talk. But however, uh, Professor Farina, I think it will be happy.